This is the second part of the biology of learning and memory. So I'm going to come back to these questions of what changes occur in a single cell during learning. So the changes in the pieces uh, and then the changes in the wiring. How do those changed cells then work together to produce adaptive behaviors or to help us learn? And then I say that we're going to start with the pieces and the parts, but I mean uh, some, something somewhat different as far as uh, the pieces and the parts. So I'm going to start by talking about the various, some of the brain, various brain regions that are involved. And that is, of course, the groups of neurons that are responding to specific kinds of stimuli. So in the first PowerPoint slide presentation of the biology of learning and memory, the first thing I did was to set up this really what does memory mean for us and especially as far as our sense of identity and our sense of self as part of our sense of self really involves our memory of who we are who we've been and our experiences throughout our throughout our lives and it's hard to imagine ourselves without memory and then i did a very brief distinction and description of classical conditioning versus operant conditioning those are really good things to understand and to understand the difference between them and it's also a good idea to just keep in mind that when we are being operantly conditioned to behave in a certain way because I'm getting a, a reinforcer or to stop behaving in a certain way because I'm getting a punishment that their classical conditioning is involved in that right I have a certain uh, inner visceral response to that reinforcer I have an inner kind of automatic visceral response to that um, punishment and then I ended with this slide because uh, this I need to come back to this to to put us in the context for the next for the next um, bunch of ideas and concepts here. So Pavlov believed that uh, what we were what was happening when we were being conditioned. So during this learning process, as we were learning this association between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus, is that that conditioning was strengthening connections between brain centers, a center of the brain that responds to the unconditioned stimulus and the center of the brain that or the area of the brain that's responding to the conditioned stimulus. And Carl Lashley set out to uh, find this, this kind of engram. So an engram is the, refers to the physical representation of what has been learned or what kind of brain changes do we see because of learning. And he went and looked in the cerebral cortex and he examined various uh, examples of classical conditioning so that he could he could figure out where learning was occurring and what he basically found was that uh, the more cerebral cortex that was left intact the better off the animal was and so he didn't find a particular area of the cerebral cortex uh, where we can find some particular engrammed engram he just said you know there's this equipotentiality it's it's really you need the entire you need as much cortex as possible two of the problems with what carl lashley was doing one was that he was looking in the cerebral cortex and that's not where we're going to see this kind of associative learning we're going to look into subcortical structures for that and two uh, because he was interested in, in this more general learning this complicated the the tasks so he was looking at various tasks it was richard f thompson and his colleagues who then realized and started to use a simpler task so uh, one specific example of classical conditioning and they started to look in various subcortical structures uh, specifically we're going to be talking quite a bit about the cerebellum the task that uh, they used was um, an aversive conditioning of a tone with a puff of air to the cornea so the unconditioned stimulus is is the puff of air to the cornea and we all know when we go to the eye doctor and they tell us to don't blink your eyes when I puff this into your cornea that this is really difficult to inhibit. We have an automatic unlearned response, so an unconditioned response of an eye blink when someone puffs air into our cornea. And so do rabbits. These, this um, research was done on rabbits. So what they do is they um, present a tone, boop, and then the puff of air to the cornea and rabbits as they have this um, the, the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus presented several times rabbits learn to give an eye blink response 
to the, the tone. Okay, they learn that the tone, of, the tone predicts the puff of air to the cornea. And what's interesting is we learn, and rabbits learn, other animals learn, that um, there's a specific timing to this. So as long as the tone it has a specific timing with the puff of air, we not only learn to have an eye blink response, but we have an eye blink response such that we avoid the puff of air to the cornea. Okay, if you know, if you now if this is making you think, oh, the cerebellum is really important for timing, right? bingo, right? Exactly. So um, your author has this really great picture that I don't have up here. I don't think they gave it to me and I thought about creating it, but I thought it would take a while. So you just have to imagine in your mind boxes, boxes going uh, an A box, B, C, D, E, F, G. I'll just go to G. And so what's going to happen there uh, when I have some kind of sensory input, sensory input is going to go to A, A is going to communicate with B to C to D to E to F to G, and G is going to communicate to my um, muscles. Okay, so some kind of motor neuron is going to go communicate to the muscles. And so somewhere in there, between the sensory input coming in and the muscle movement going out of blinking my eyes, learning is occurring. And for us to figure out where learning is occurring is pretty tricky because if I stop the motor movement, so if anything's happening at, let's say, let's just say E, F, and G, and what those are really involved with is the motor response, then learning might still be occurring, but I can't see that learning that's occurring. So I have to kind of have to start out as far as I can at E, F, and maybe, maybe F as, or E, and then move backwards and say, where is learning occurring? Is it occurring at D? Is it occurring at C? Okay, so this is what Richard F. Thompson and his colleagues uh, did. And what's being shown in these figures uh, at the bottom or the mid bottom right is um, the very leftmost figure. So I can't see any A, Bs, or Cs. So the very leftmost figure, that is the basic acquisition curve. If you've taken learning and memory, uh, hopefully, or, or introductory psychology, uh, I do this in several psychology psychology classes, but that is the basic acquisition curve where my um, I have the number of trials along the x-axis, along the y-axis. I'm showing basically the, the strength of the response or I'm showing learning. I'm showing some measure of learning, learning. And so in the first trial, I don't have any learning because I haven't learned the association yet. This is the first time I've gotten the association. By the second trial, I've done some learning by the third, by the fourth. Um, depends on really the study that we're doing and the specific association that we're learning. But so in this example, by it looks like the fourth trial, I'm at my plateau. I, I am at my maximum learning. Okay, and what they're showing, so as we move off to the um, right in the next pair of figures, uh, what we're showing is they have gone in and they have cooled the lateral interpositus nucleus or else they've injected a, a, a chemical such that it's turned off or inhibited the lateral interpositus nucleus of the cerebellum um, while the rabbit is getting the tone and the puff of air. And what we see in the top figure is what's happening while that uh, LIP, while the lateral interpositus nucleus is cooled. And what's happening is it looks like there's no learning occurring, right? I'm never showing the acquisition curve. I'm never showing any, any lear learning. What's being shown in the figure underneath that is after, so now the la lateral interpositus nucleus is um, back in play, uh, the chemicals worn off, the cooling's worn off, and I can use my lateral interpositus nucleus, and they do the same thing of giving the, the tone, boop, and a puff of air, and what we see there is a regular acquisition curve. And so it looks like no learning had actually occurred. I, I'm now just seeing the same kind of acquisition curve that I saw at the start if without any without any brain regions being taken out okay we're going to move one level out so let's just say that was if we look at a b c d e f g let's just say the lateral interpositus nucleus was c we're moving one level out to d okay but it could be right that learning was occurring at d and i was not getting the sensory information 
So we can move out to D. And so now we're going to look at our, which is the red nucleus, which is the midbrain structure that is communicating to, um, communicating to motor neurons. If we move out to the, the red nucleus, and um, again, we're going to start, start with the top figure, we cool or inject a chemical, to so we're inhibiting the red nucleus. Uh, what's happening in that figure is no learning is occurring, right? Again, there's no response, no, res no change in response because we're getting the tone and the puff of air um, being presented together again and again. Now we bring back the red nucleus. We allow it to um, come back uh, and um, the chemical to wear off or whatever. And we start pre presenting the tone and the puff of air again. Okay, and now we see that the animals are up at plateau, right? Even though the red nucleus was, be was being cooled and we had no response, once we brought the red nucleus back, it looks like they learned this association because there is no learning curve. I'm already at my maximum learning. So we move back, back, backwards again. <laughs> we go back again to the lateral interpositus nucleus and say, okay, that's where learning occurred. So they discovered the engram for this particular eye blink response um, for this, this kind of um, classical conditioning, this, this aversive uh, conditioning in the lateral interpositus nucleus of the cerebellum. So I'm gonna repeat some of what I just said in, in a lot of ways, but this is um, with words on the screen and this is research that has been done on humans. So it, it is slightly different to discuss. But so PET imaging on people shows that if we pair a puff of air with another stimulus, so we have our condition stimulus and it predicts a puff of air, whatever that other stimulus is, tone, light, and so forth, it causes activity in the cerebellum, in the red nucleus, and in several other areas. We also see that people with damage to the cerebellum show weaker conditioned eye blinks and those eye blink responses are less accurately timed relative to the onset of the air puff. As, as I just said, when we what we learn to do is we if we get the same timing between the tone and the puff of air, we learn to blink our eyes so that we avoid the puff of air. But people with damage to their cerebellum have um, weaker uh, conditioned eye blinks, but also they're not hitting that at the right time to avoid the puff of air. And so if you remember us talking about damage to the cerebellum before as people who have a harder time um, with keeping a rhythm or uh, changing uh, visual and auditory attention, uh, this is another example of um, what happens when you have damage to the cerebellum. And all of this, as all learning in the cerebellum does, all of this depends on that short interval of the pairing between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus, which if you remember, if we go back to what do we need for classical conditioning, one is contiguity, a short pairing between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus, at least for the most part, for things not like taste aversion. I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. I know I'm gonna end up chopping this into, this is gonna be chopped because the types of memory, we actually have lots of different kinds of memory and they are um, relatively complicated because each type of memory is in itself, it houses a lot underneath it. But Donald Hebb, who was um, a physiological psychologist, suggested that we need more than one mechanism to explain all of the phenomena of learning and memory. And so we just talked about classical conditioning and operant conditioning, but that, that kind of learning and that kind of memory is um, really different than sometimes what we think of as memory. So he distinguished, he said it was necessary, necessary to distinguish between short-term memory, so memories, memory for events that have just occurred. If someone gives us a short string of letters or a short string of numbers that we have to remember for a little while, so someone gives me their phone number, I can keep that in short-term memory, that's really gonna be different than long-term memory or memory for events that happened farther back in time. If someone gives me a string of numbers to remember, unless I really do some strong encoding of that, 
or use that over and over again for that particular person, uh, if I get that one time and remember it, I'm not going to have a long-term memory trace back for those, those numbers. Uh, that was something I was keeping in short-term memory. Whereas if we think uh, back to uh, some birthday that we remember from our past, I usually use my fifth grade birthday party. I, ha I went had a skating party. It was probably one of my most exciting birthday parties. And I, and I kind of remember parts of it. That is that is something that is not going to be in short-term memory all the time, right? I don't have that hanging around uh, while I'm doing other things, or that would be a lot of clutter. That's back in my long-term memory. We've discovered a great deal about these memory systems since Hebb proposed them, and actually we've discovered more aspects and more, again, complications to those memory systems. Uh, this all started with research by Peterson and Peterson in 1959 and Brown 1958. It didn't all start, but the but the um, looking really distinguishing short-term memory from long-term memory is clear in this Peterson and Peterson and Brown. And usually, what I do here, and I have left my slides because I I really I love talking about memory, and I think it's a good thing for you to actually, if you can possibly do this to um, think about the green questions and to perform some of these tasks on, on your own, uh, maybe with a friend. So what I say here is we're going to distinguish short-term memory and long-term memory with a quick serial position task. And so what I do then is read out a list of words, and I'm going to go ahead and give just a few words here as an example, but I usually go and get some words from a random word generator which I'll suggest if you're going to do this with a friend, you get um, about 15 words. And um, I'm, I'm just going to give you, so five. Uh, I usually use um, something like uh, dog, purple, canoe, elephant, desk. Okay, and, I, and I'll call those out relatively quickly, not that quickly, but, but maybe counting maybe two seconds between each one. That was just five words, and I'm not going to remember them all now, but dog, purple, canoe, elephant. Desk are not hard for me to remember because I usually use dog, purple, and elephant. <laughs> so all I really did was throw in a couple of <laughs> different words. So because I like elephants, love dogs. Dogs are in every single memory task that I play with my students. So if you're in another class with me, guess dog. <laughs> anyway, pick out 15 words. And what you'll see is that people are, and you'll see this most likely, it's hard to see with one person, but what you'll see is they do better at the very beginning. So if we are, so pretend that was 15 words and not five, they'll do better with dog and purple because those were the first two words. And then they'll do better at the very end. Sometimes with maybe they'll just have desk. They might have elephant and desk. But uh, sometimes they just have one or two words. Sometimes they have more like four or five words over at the at the end. And what we see there is, and then we see in the middle that people are forgetting a lot of the middle. It's hard to see with one person because sometimes there are people who always, who remember some of those middle words. And when you add all the people together, I, this always works in every class. There is some little uh, bump up with sometimes some like a few people remember a word, but usually we have pretty low accuracy generally for those middle about um, seven or eight words if we're using 15, uh, more like 10 or 12 words if we're using 20 words. Um, but we're, that middle is has very little accuracy. The beginning they're very good, and at the end they're very good. Why are we saying we're distinguishing between long term and short term memory? The idea is, so if I'm just giving you 15 words and you can write them down or spit them back out as quickly as possible, people typically start by spitting out those last couple words because they're still in short-term memory. So you're, you're kind of doing this rehearsing or thinking through the words, and those words are still in short-term memory, and you just jot those down. And then what you also have are words that got into a long-term memory. As you were first getting words, you were able to rehearse those words over and over again, but as more words kept coming in, you weren't able to do that rehearsal, so those first words were the most likely to get into long-term memory, and that's usually what we see, is people remember the first words, getting them from long-term memory, and the few last words 
getting them from short-term memory. Do that with a couple friends. It is, it's a fun little task. It always works. You can't see it with one person or two people, but once you get 10 people in there, I've, that has worked in every single class I've ever taught. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, a number of neurological double dissociations as we talk about memory, because we do see these double dissociations, which show us. Uh, so basically in a double dissociation, we can see one patient with impairment to a particular structure or um, damage to a particular structure, and they have one function, I'm going to say function A impaired, while function B is intact. And then we have another patient with damage to a different structure, and now function A is the one that's intact, and function B is the one that's impaired. And so this is very clear with uh, short-term memory versus long-term memory that these different structures of the brain are involved with those two different memory systems. And because we see this double dissociation, we know that those structures can behave independently. I don't need the one structure for the other structure to do its job, basically, and I don't need the other structure for the one structure to do its job. Uh, and so some people who've shown us this, if we look at Clive Waring or HM, and I'm gonna talk about HM quite a bit, uh, probably in the next slideshow, uh, he had um, his hippocampi and actually some other areas around that of his medial temporal lobes removed in order to stop uh, epileptic seizures. He was having multiple seizures uh, a day and sometimes a pretty major seizure, um, but often enough that they removed this part of his brain hoping to stop those epileptic seizures. But what happened was he could no longer lay down or consolidate explicit memories. So this was impairing his long-term memory as he could no longer lay down new long-term memories. And we see the same thing with Clive Waring. So if you look him up on um, YouTube or anything, there's a pretty neat um, video of him talking and his wife talking. He uh, also has, um, he had some encephalitis and was unable to lay down new memories. And he was actually, if I'm remembering correctly, the example that I gave at the very beginning of, oh, at last I'm conscious. Now I'm really conscious. And they look at their own writing and go, that wasn't me. I wasn't conscious before. And they get all frustrated that, that it looks like they're writing. But obviously, um, I'm just now uh, conscious. So that is really long-term memory. These people still have an intact short-term memory. And your author gives this great example. I'm not going to go through the whole example of um, giving him three numbers to remember and uh, letting him for 15 minutes just and then quizzing him on those three numbers for 15 minutes as he's keeping those in short-term memory and uh, not distracting him because that's key but at the three 15 minutes later he remembers the three numbers he tells you this whole big strategy for remembering those three numbers and then you distract him and get him to do something else and all of that's gone he no longer has the three numbers and he no longer remembers the strategy that he just told you as that was his short-term memory though was was fine but once we're distracted right we've lost what was in short-term memory and they um uh, we are um distinguishing them from kf who has damage to the frontal cortex so the short-term memory is impaired and not long-term memory it of course is more difficult to get information into long-term memory but because usually we have to pay some attention to and do some kind of encoding to get information into long-term memory and without short-term memory that is uh, that is difficult but it happens uh, if they are doing a particular kind of encoding when information comes in they can remember things and especially if something has some emotional impact on them, they will remember it. So I'm gonna give a story. I have a couple of stories of people I've met who have some kind of brain damage. And this was actually, I met the man's mother and um, I was talking with her and she was complaining about her son, about some of uh, what, how he treated her and so forth. And so um, she was telling me that he had some emotional outbursts sometimes and that, um, he, he had a little bit more frustration in his life and um, he 
also he would not remember things unless she did something really self-deprecating so tell this story on, on herself of um remember to use the oven mitts the last time i didn't use the oven mitts i burnt myself and it was oh, oh, oh and she would do something kind of funny and uh, but a little bit self-deprecating and he would laugh at it at that and he would remember that but he wouldn't remember other things that she told him and she felt like he was just not paying attention uh but but if she but if he could laugh at her he'd remember and i said well i can tell you what happened it he, she said he was in a car wreck and i said I, I, let me tell you what i think happened and what i think is happening with him what i think happened was he wasn't wearing his seatbelt, right? And he hit the um, right part of his frontal area of the brain, so the frontal cortex. And she said, yes, that's exactly what happened. And I said, well, what happened there then is that is the area where you put language on your emotions. And so he's no longer able to tell you how he feels. And so what ends up happening, he also doesn't have some of the inhibitory connections. What's happening is his emotions are more frustrating to him and he can't explain them as well what's also happening is his short-term memory was impaired and um, he can remember things but he needs some kind of emotional tag that needs to go through the amygdala and the hippocampus and it needs to be remembered and encoded in some way that's very memorable without him having to pay attention and to give some kind of um, this kind of working memory attentional um, he can, he does he, that part of his brain is damaged and so it's not you don't necessarily have to be self-deprecating to yourself you can make fun of somebody else or you can uh, say something sad something that will make sure that he remembers uh, what you say it's, it needs to be emotionally tagged and she was appreciative and it really does help it's one of those examples like my brother with schizophrenia where it really does help to understand how somebody else's brain is working differently because we can give more um, empathy and compassion but also understanding for how for how sometimes we might feel like we're being treated where we have to say that's just how their brain works and there's really no way to to change that but i can i can make things better for myself with my behavior